<sighs> it's kind of hard to dramatically sit in a chair when it's so low to the ground. It, it just feels awkward. But anyways, yeah. Uh, so the second season of Wheel of Time just ended a couple of days ago as of this filming. And whatever else we may say about it, whatever else we may think, most people have been saying, and I happen to agree, that it's a massive step up from season one. Like, just in terms of quality, it is not leagues better, but it is a lot better. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. And in a weird way, it follows the exact same pattern as the books, because what I mean by that is that, yeah, the show does change a fair amount from the source material, but the thing is, season one, overall enjoyable, but it had plenty of issues. Like, there, there was just some weird lines, some of the sets and costuming were a little strange, actors were overall solid, but some of them hadn't quite gotten into their roles yet, and the writing was a bit clumsy because you're just trying to introduce everyone to this. And the first book in the series, Eye of the World, is kind of the same. You know, it's bad in some different ways, but it is still very clumsy and weirdly put together because, like, some characters that are major characters just don't have personalities yet. You're trying to be introduced to the world, but there's just so much stuff that you need to know that a lot of the stuff in the first book doesn't make sense until much later. Like, the prologue of the first book does not make sense without hindsight. At the time you read it, it is weird and incomprehensible. And the ending of the first book as well is also very strange. But then, once you get into the second book, The Great Hunt, that's where the series really starts to find its footing, and it, it's just a lot better in almost every way. Like, the story is more focused, there's a lot less time wasted, the characters are more well-defined and have stronger personalities and stronger motivations and such, and their arcs really begin, as opposed to them just being introduced as, yeah, here's this person, and they get like one or two things about their personality that we know. And then season two, again, is pretty much the same. Like, now that everything is set up and a bit more solidified, it is just a lot better than season one. So where we left off last time, Rand and Moiraine went to the Eye of the World. They supposedly defeated the Dark One and sealed him back away, but Rand faked his death and then ran off somewhere far away. And now everyone else is just trying to deal with the fallout of that. However, it's pretty obvious from the start, and we learned very explicitly later on, that they did not defeat the Dark One at the, eye, the end of the first season, at the Eye of the World. Like, they, they didn't. Uh, the guy they were fighting was actually not the Dark One. It was Ishamael, who is essentially his lieutenant. You know, he is the leader of the Forsaken, who are his most powerful servants. And he's literally thousands of years old. He is an insanely powerful channeler. Like, how could they ever possibly stand against him? And he was just pretending to be the Dark One, which is exactly what happened in the books. But, again, I just need to take a second to say this. People who have read the books, stop spoiling shit in the comments, really. Because, again, there's a lot of stuff that happens early in the story that doesn't make sense until you have later context. But people who have read the books seem allergic to acknowledging that sometimes. Because so many of them just refuse to acknowledge that, oh yeah, we didn't know that at the time, so by me saying this right now, that would be spoiling stuff. Because there were tons of people who, when talking about season one, were referring to the Dark One as Ishamael, and I'm like, guys, we didn't know he was Ishamael at the, at the time. We didn't find that out until the third fucking book. Like, in the show we find it out a little sooner, which I think is fine. I don't think it really makes a difference one way or the other, but either way, we find out much sooner that, oh, okay, that wasn't really the Dark One. But, that out of the way, it is kind of hard to explain this story in a lot of detail, at least without getting into spoilers, and even with getting into spoilers, it's hard to explain the story of Season 2 too, in a lot of detail, because there's a lot of different plot lines that it follows, and they are of greatly varying quality, let's say. <laughs> and that is kind of a shame, because the second book, again, is where the series starts to find its footing, and the story is much more focused. It's a pretty basic, or maybe basic isn't the right word for it, but it is a quest fantasy. You know, you have to go to this place to either do a thing or find a magical object to save the world or whatever like that. And while there are some diversions, it is almost entirely focused on that. Whereas season two of the show does the same thing a lot of television does nowadays, where they just 
have a lot of different storylines all going on at once and it's not immediately clear how they tie together and sometimes they're all good but most of the time some of them are good some of them are bad and it just i don't know man it goes up and down and that is an issue with the uh, wheel of time season two like a, a pretty big issue actually like matt's storyline starts off pretty good like he's not in the first episode much but then we see him and like okay he's imprisoned at the white tower and it has to do with like all the stuff he had with that evil magical dagger from the last season and then after a couple episodes it just stops being interesting and they aren't it seems like they're not sure what to do with him up until the finale where he comes in and then his storyline becomes good again and then same with Perrin's storyline which is fine at the beginning and then in the middle it's like they it's not bad necessarily, but it's like they aren't sure what to do with him because he's just kind of wandering around meeting some new people and getting prepared for, again, the finale. And then in the finale, his storyline becomes good again. And then Rand's storyline starts off really, really weak, but then it ramps up and gets better about halfway through. And by the end of the se season, again, it's very, very good. Moiraine's storyline is kind of iffy up until the end, I'll be honest. Like... Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but there's there's like a lot of up and down in her storyline. It's I don't know what to make of it to be honest, but then by the end it becomes solid. But like basically the only storyline, the only character storyline who I would say is solid throughout the entire season is Egwene's because she starts off training in the White Tower and we get to see that. That's nice seeing her make new friends and seeing her actually learn about the One Power so that the people who haven't read the books can learn more about it and how it works. And then gets into some trouble, and then her storyline gets really, really dark in the last couple episodes. Like, it is brutal the kind of shit she goes through, and then at the end, it again becomes really good, really triumphant. And so, her storyline is solid throughout the season, but everyone else's is kind of up and down. Now, the good news about that is that usually at the times where one or two storylines are kind of dull and not, and they weren't grabbing me, the others were good, and while those other ones were kind of bad, the other ones were good. So, it's uh, that I don't know if I worded that super well, but basically when one is good, the others are bad, but I would prefer if they were all good, if at all possible. And the reason that I think this wound up being so weird and clumsy is because it is a fair bit different than the book. Because again, the book is mostly just focused on one storyline with a couple of smaller diversions, whereas this, they had characters all split up all over the place. And having different characters split all over the place, all doing their own thing and not really connecting to each other that well and not always being that interesting and I was just sitting there going, okay, let's get back to the cooler characters with their own storylines because those are better. That was reminding me of the later books in the series and that's not a good thing because the later books in the series are really, really weak. Like, if you haven't read them, the first couple are flawed but solid and then once you reach about the halfway point of the series, like, book six or seven, that's where things take a steep decline and the pacing just slows to a crawl. And then the last couple books it picks up again. But yeah, this was reminding me of those points in the books where we had like 30 page chapters and it's just characters walking from room to room and we're following their thoughts. It's like, it's not great. However, I will say that this worked out in its favor in one way. And I don't know if this was intentional or not, but basically there is a big theme in this season of characters trying to protect their loved ones by pushing them away and then realizing by the end that that's wrong and they can't do that. Like, you can't protect your loved ones by pushing them away. You have to stick by them. Like, uh, the most obvious example of that is Rand, who, again, he faked his death to get away from his friends because he was afraid that uh, by being a man who can channel, he would go crazy and kill them all sooner or later. So he just didn't want to be near them when that happened. And then we also have Moiraine trying to push away Lan, who, even though he's trying desperately to help her. And obviously there's Matt, who ran away from his friends near the end of season one. That's also partially because of, like, issues outside of the show, show's control. But, you know, like, that is what he did. And then later on in this season, he also kind of abandons his friends, at least for a little while. But basically it's these characters realizing, okay, I, I was pushing my loved ones away to try and protect them, but then I realized they're in trouble and I was not there to help them out when they were in trouble, so I need to stay by my loved ones in order to protect them. And that actually works really well, not only on its own, but as an adaptation, because that's gonna be a big part of Rand's character arc going forward. Not gonna 
spoil too much about that, but those who've read the books know what I'm talking about. And last season, while again it was overall enjoyable, the finale was a pretty big letdown for me because it felt like the um, build-up to all the events was really good and really solid, but then the actual events themselves were pretty lackluster and underwhelming, so I was really not into the finale of the first season. Uh, granted, it's trying to adapt to the finale of the first book, which is really odd and confusing. Or, not even odd, but it is confusing and hard to follow, but it's also, like, epic and has a lot of stuff going on, whereas season one didn't really have that. But anyways, season two finale did not have that problem. It is properly built up to, and then the climax is very, very enjoyable. It's great. Like, it feels like the characters are not in control of the entire world, like, not everything revolves around them, but they are still very powerful and very important to the world. And the final battle's a lot of fun, there's a whole lot of stuff going on, seeing the characters all come back together to fight evil is great, and I hope that they stick together a little bit more going forward, because, again, that's a huge issue with the books, and I'm hoping the show, at the very least, won't make that problem worse. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, going forward into Season 3, I'm hoping there's, like, three storylines that they follow, and they don't try to split it more beyond that, like, without going into spoilers. I'm hoping they follow Rand's storyline as he goes off traveling places, Perrin's storyline as he has to travel somewhere else, and then the White Tower storyline. And those who've read the books know exactly what I'm talking about. Once again, if you're going to put spoilers, mark them. But story-wise, yeah, this season was uneven, I think is a good way of putting it, but it was still a step up from season one overall. On top of that, the production values from this season have shot up quite a bit. And I didn't dislike the production of season one. You know, I didn't dislike the way channeling looked. I didn't dislike the costuming or the set design or anything. But in this season, it's a big step up. Like, you can see a whole bunch of different, very distinct cultures all over the place throughout the whole season just in people's uh, dress and the architecture. Like, it's very, very distinct from place to place. Like, the architecture of Falm is very, very different than the White Tower, which was very different than Shinar from season one. Or, I shouldn't say White Tower, I should say Tarvalon, which is different than Shinar or the Two Rivers or anywhere else from Season 1. And the way characters dress is very similar. Like, the Shan Chan, both their outfits and their ships, are really weird looking compared to everything else. And I loved all of that because it really helps this show look different than other fantasy shows. You know, it doesn't just look generic medieval European, it actually looks different. And also, it's not just... To totally drab and colorless like a lot of stuff tries to be nowadays. You know, it's actually, there's colors. And like I said, the channeling does look better than before. You know, like, characters doing different things does look distinct as opposed to just random blobs of energy coming out of them. <laughs> and you see them do a little bit more with it. Like, there's one scene where Swan uh, summons a whole bunch of knives made of air around her head because she thinks she, somebody's about to attack her, and then she relaxes, and they all just disappear. Like, for instance, just just one instance, okay? Again, it's kind of hard to talk about some of this without going into spoilers, that'll be later, but basically we see a lot more stuff you can do with the One Power, and that's great. I also felt that the acting was a step up. Again, acting was solid enough in the first season. There were one or two kind of weak performances, like the actor who plays Perrin was kind of weak, and in this season I would still say he is the weakest of them all, but he's improved a bit, like he seems more comfortable being Perrin, and same with all the other characters. Because this is where the performances get a little bit tricky. Season 1 was really just introducing us to these people and letting us know, yeah, here's how they are, here's who they are, they're pretty simple at this stage, but they exist, make them kind of likable. And then Season 2 is where they really start to go on their journeys, where they go through a lot more stuff. Like, they go through good things, bad things, they have some horrifying, traumatic experiences, and they really start to change. So this is where they start to develop and become much, much deeper and more complex characters. Now, the real standouts in terms of performance are Egwene and Matt, because Egwene, as I said, nice enough girl. She seems like just a regular girl from a small town who wants to see the world at first, and then over the course of season one, we see like, okay, there's a bit more to her. And then season two, again, she goes through <laughs> horrifying shit. And we realize by the end of the season, okay, she's, she's kind of a bad person. She does some pretty unpleasant stuff. It's 
arguably justifiable, but she does some pretty unpleasant stuff. And being able to remain sympathetic and likable while you're doing that is very difficult, but it is a line that a lot of characters in Wheel of Time manage to walk. And then we also, again, have Matt, who his actor wound up getting changed out between seasons for reasons the public has never been made aware of. Uh, but honestly, while I thought that the original actor for him was really good, I think the new one is a step up. Like, you know, he adds in a lot of humor, like his jokes and everything land pretty well. He just seems like a really nice, likable dude, but also you can tell that that likable exterior is hiding all, some really low self-esteem and some serious depression, anxiety, that sort of thing. He doesn't really have a lot to do until the finale, but that is an issue that's carried over from the books. Because in the books, Matt has no personality for the entirety of the first two books other than kind of being an ass occasionally and thinking that he's really funny, but not really being that funny. But then at the end of book two in the finale, he finally gets his big moment and you're like, yes, cool, Matt gets to do stuff. And then from then on, he develops and changes and becomes a much better character. He's my favorite in the series as well as a lot of other people's. And the show does something kind of similar. He doesn't have a lot to do, but once he gets his big moment, you realize, okay, yes, this guy is capable of being a hero and I want to see him do more stuff. The fight scenes are great too. Don't, don't have a lot to say there. They were good in season one and they're good here. There's only a couple of big ones, but they're all, they're all really fun. I think it's a little strange to see just how superhuman some of the characters are sometimes, but if that's the tone they want to go for, then all right, that's the, that's the tone they want to go for. And that's about it, you know? <laughs> Uh, at least for the non-spoiler stuff, like, I, the only major issues I have are, like, again, the structure of the story is really weird and kind of clumsy at times and just results in an uneven season where there's some parts which are amazing and some parts which are much less amazing as opposed to having it be smoother. Is that, is that a real word, really, for, in this scenario? Whatever. There's also a couple of really weird moments like in the first episode, there's a moment where Egwene walks in on some characters having a threesome, which I'm, I'm not saying that you can't put that there, but like, why? I, I don't get it. And there, there are just other moments like that throughout the season, which were kind of weird, took me out of it, and I just wasn't into them. And that's, yeah, that's about it. But overall, again, season two, Good watch. I enjoyed it. Uh, if you weren't a fan of season one, I would recommend at least checking this one out because now it feels like a proper fantasy epic. And I do need to take a moment to mention that I don't like all of the changes they're making from the books. You know, not, not all of them. And I mean, you have to judge it like as its own thing and as an adaptation. And as an adaptation, I don't like all of the changes. You know, some of them are good changes. Some of them are fine, just kind of a lateral move, don't make much difference. But then there are plenty of bad ones too, and they are like weird or clumsy or just stupid. For example, most of the storyline about Matt and the dagger, like in the book, he just took this magical dagger from a cursed city, which was stupid of him, and then it wound up forming a bond with him, and he started dying from it, and they weren't able to break the bond right away, and at the beginning of the second book, the dagger gets stolen, so he has to go off and grab it because if he's separated from it for too long, then he'll die and also they need to have the dagger with them in order to break the bond between them and so that it'll get better again. Whereas in the show, they've already broken the bond with it, but he's still tempted by it and like he wants to get it again. It's, it's almost like a drug of some sort that he's addicted to and he's trying to kick the habit. And I, I'm not sure where they're going with this storyline, to be honest, because in the books, like at the beginning of the third book, he's just healed and then you're done. And also, if you were unaware, this season is basically combining books two and three together, which works all right overall. But yeah, at the beginning of book three, Matt is just healed from his problem with the dagger, and then it doesn't really come back again after that. And in the show, I'm not sure where they're going with it. Like, he, he's still trying to kick the habit. He's still an addict, I guess. So... I, I guess I can't judge it too harshly if I don't know how it ends up, but still, it is a weird choice. Another change that I just didn't like was how the Horn of Valir is barely focused on in the show, whereas like in the books, they, you see it and you're like, oh, this is a really big deal that we found this thing because this is going to blow at the last battle and it'll summon the heroes of the Horn, 
and then they are going to come in and save everybody. Whereas in the show, they barely mention it, and then it gets stolen, and then some characters have to go off and grab it and get it back, but they don't really explain why it's important. And by the finale, we do understand why it's important, but that moment isn't really built up to. And we do understand by the end of the season that it's important, but it's just weird that we don't get that information until much later. Uh, but that said, a lot of the hate about this as an adaptation is just pure culture war shit. You know, it's people just making comments and complaining that, oh man, this woman character got the spotlight in a scene where she also got the spotlight in the books, or, oh my god, black people exist. Like, th there was a subreddit called r slash white cloaks, which was created as soon as they announced some of the casting for the show many years ago, and it was d dedicated solely to complaining that non-white people exist in this story, which had non-white people to begin with, and then that subreddit got shut down around the time season one ended because they were just constantly brigading other subreddits to try and cause trouble. Like, again, not everyone who hates this show or has any issues with this show is doing it just for culture war points, but that is where a lot of this comes from, and that's what makes it annoying to talk about. Like, I, I said it in my review of the first season, but the Wheel of Time books would get cancelled by the right today if they came out today. Like, because the series is not entirely about, but largely about how, hey, gender norms are kind of shit, and how living in a matriarchal society is just as shit as living in a patriarchal one. Like, there's a lot of points reading where when I was younger I went, oh, is that what that's like from the opposite direction? Well, okay, I can see why women would hate that now. And Robert Jordan was unabashedly a feminist. Like, he was a second wave feminist, which is a bit different than modern ones, but he very much was. Like, you can cry about that all you want, but that's what the books are. Like, the only reason that a lot of you are upset with that is because I'm using the word feminist. <laughs> and you have been trained like a dog to react negatively when you hear that. But that's about all for non-spoilers. Like I said, season two, solid watch, has issues in it, but I'm hoping those can be smoothed over in the future, and it is a big step up from season one, so whatever the case, uh, check it out. And let's go into spoiler section now, and this is gonna be not spoilers for the whole book series, but spoilers for this season of television and the books up until this point. What is this? Shitload of mashed potatoes day? Okay, so first thing I need to talk about is Celine slash Lanfear. Like, she is this woman that Rand is just in a relationship with at the beginning of the season, and if you haven't read the books, then you're probably thinking, hey, something's off about her. She seems kind of suspicious. And while the way she's introduced is different in the show than in the books, it's a pretty similar feeling. You're instantly thinking, yeah, this lady's suspicious. And then a couple episodes later, it turns out, oh shit, She's one of the Forsaken. She's a servant of the Dark One. And I gotta say, her actress steals every single scene that she is in. Like, she does a phenomenal job. Uh, she might be one of the best in actors in this entire show so far, because every time she's on screen, she just feels evil, but also very tempting and seductive at the same time. I, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but, like, you just know that she's not gonna hurt you for no reason, but as soon as you get on her bad side, you're in serious trouble. And yet, she does care about Rand in a weird way. Which, again, that lines up with her character in the books. Like, she is weirdly in love with him, but she's evil, so it's like a weird possessive love. And then, uh, obviously, there's Ishamael, who is the only other Forsaken we see up until the final scene of this season. And his performance is also great. You know, you can tell that while he does evil things, he himself isn't really evil evil, he just, he genuinely thinks he's doing the right thing and he wants to end suffering. Like that, that's basically his idea is to free the Dark One, destroy the world, and then all suffering will end. He's, I, I don't want to compare him to Buddhists because that may, might reflect poorly on Buddhists, but in a weird way, yeah, he's like taking that ideology in a strange direction. But it's also clear that, again, he's doing this just because he wants to die. He wants to cease existing. And if you didn't understand that, then in the first scene of the finale, he just comes right out and says, I want to die, please kill me. So, like, it, it's literally coming out and telling you that's what he wants. Uh, and so that's why the final battle works pretty well. Because, yeah, you, you would think that 
the characters fighting him, like Egwene, would not be able to stand up to him for any length of time, really, but he's also clearly not trying that hard. You know what I mean? Like, he's very, very powerful, but he also just wants this shit to be over with, so in a weird way, he's, like, allowing Egwene and the others to kill him. And again, it's like a moment where Egwene and Perrin and them all come together and work together to fight against the bad guy. And while Lanfear and Ishamael are both terrifying, they're also not super good at their jobs. Which, again, that fits in perfectly with the Forsaken from the books. And in the last scene where we see Mog Hedian, again, she's terrifying, but we'll see going forward that, you know what, maybe, maybe people who devote their lives to evil just aren't the best at doing things. Maybe they're incompetent. And at the end of last season, there was a moment where it seemed like Moiraine got cut off from the One Power, like she was stilled and she can't channel anymore. And that leads into a weird storyline this season. I don't even know if I'd call it bad necessarily, but it is weird. Because I was pretty sure while watching last time that she wasn't actually stilled, she was just shielded, meaning she can't access it. And uh, because the magic that men use and the magic that women use are totally different, she can't actually see the shield that she is shielded with. Uh, and so we spend most of the season with her being shielded, but thinking that she's actually stilled and just trying to go through and help Rand and help the world without being able to use her powers. And then near the end, uh, Lan actually has a talk with Loghain, who was the false dragon from the previous season, who did get cut off from the One Power permanently, and uh, Loghain tells him, like, oh yeah, she's not stilled, she is just shielded. And so Lan has a moment where he talks to Rand, and he's like, hey, uh, maybe you can break through that, and then he breaks through it. And, like, again, I don't know if I'd call this storyline bad necessarily, but it is weird, and it goes on longer than it probably should. But I will say a lot of people were complaining that Lan is able to tell Rand this, and I'm like, why? You know, again, it's not like he figured all this out on his own. He was told by somebody else who has more knowledge about the subject. And also, it's not weird that he would know the basics of channeling. You know, he's been around Aes Sedai for literal decades. It's not strange that he would understand some of this stuff. You know, everyone who has read the books, you cannot channel, and yet you understand the basics of them because you've read about them. <laughs> like, it's not strange. You also had some people claiming that Rand does nothing in the final battle, and that's not true. He does some stuff, but not as much as in the book. You know, like, he does have a moment where he comes out and kills the leader of the Shan Chan, who, who fucking cares about his name? Like, I don't, no one cares his name. I, it, he just comes out and he kills him. And in the book, it was stupid because that guy was a blade master and Rand was able to fight him sword fight him and then win even though he's only been training for like six weeks at that point whereas in the show it's actually a very amusing moment like it's like that moment in indiana jones where he takes out a sword and swings it around he's like haha come at me bro and then he just pulls out a gun and shoots him and Rand just kills him with a fireball like it's it's amusing and he does land the final blow on ishamael at the end but that's about it. A lot of the heavy lifting is done by his friends. And I get that the story isn't about him. It's about everybody. And he has a multi-page long monologue at the end where he's like, hey, I couldn't have done it alone. It wasn't about me. It was about everybody. But still, it is kind of underwhelming because in the books, we had a giant battle in the sky where he fought against Ishamael, who at this point was still pretending to be the Dark One. And then he defeated him, and like that was the moment everybody realized, oh shit, the, the dragon really is reborn. That, that, this is for real, holy shit. And that was kind of the moment where he had accepted, like, okay, yes, I am. Th this is who I am. And in this version, it's just kind of underwhelming. You know, like, it, again, it's a good climax to good final battle and everything, but as the dragon reborn, he needs to be more impressive. You know, he needs to do something more <laughs> than this. And I'm hoping in uh, further seasons we will get to see more of that so we can actually see, yes, okay, R Rand really is a force to be reckoned with because, it, I don't know, in this version he just doesn't seem like the world-shattering power that he's supposed to be. And one final change I want to mention real quick is that they're bringing in the Black Aja much earlier than in the books. Like, it, it's clear 
from the beginning that, okay, yes, there are Aes Sedai who are evil and who are serving the Shadow, and we get to see a lot of that. Not only do we get them played much more sympathetically, like we understand, okay, yes, they, they're they turning evil not because they're just evil for the sake of it, but they have actual reasons for it, which is kind of nice. Like, again, it uh, reminds me of Ishamael, who is a fantastic villain, in the books at least, uh, and still a good one in the show so far, and, because he's one of the only evil characters who isn't evil just for the sake of it. Like he, he genuinely thinks he's doing the right thing. And so seeing the Black Aja appear earlier and seeing how they are screwing over everybody and how they are a rot within the organization is great. You know, that, that's one change that I am 100% I, I am behind. Other than that, I don't really know what to make of various changes until later on because we won't see their full effects until later on. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that's about all. Like, my spoiler-filled thoughts, like, I don't know, I feel like I'm in agreement with the general consensus here. I thought that Egwene getting captured by the Shan Chan and tortured for days or weeks at, on end was appropriately horrifying, and the moment where she killed Rena was, again, horrifying, but, like, you kind of get it, and you're realizing, okay, Egwene's kind of a bad person. Uh, the final battle, like I said, was a lot of fun. I like that we're seeing Rand go away from being, like, just a nice farm boy into being a much darker and more hardened character because of the stuff he's gone through. Like, he's just now starting that journey, but trust me, it'll get much worse as time goes on. Uh, I like that Moiraine has a bit more to do than just guide the characters now. Uh, like, her showing up in the final battle and destroying some of the Sean Chan, ship, Sean Chan ships was really great. And overall, just, yeah, it's enjoyable. Like, there are some bits of information that I kind of wish would be in the show that were in the books at this point. Like, we don't know exactly who the Shan Chan are at this stage, but whatever. Overall, like I keep saying, it's a step up from season one. It's enjoyable television overall. So, yeah, ch <laughs> check it out. Those are those are my thoughts. Kind of scattered, but overall, the this season is scattered. Hi, everyone. You watched to the end. You're probably familiar with the patron names that are on screen right now. You know, you, you understand the concept, right? Like, these are all the people that send me money once a month over on Patreon. If you want to get early access to videos as well as some other goodies and get your name up here, then consider donating. Or don't, you know, I, I'm not a cop, I can't force you. And especially huge thanks to all of my $10 and up patrons, who are Oppo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Chibs Ahoy, Dan Antsilievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, James M, Karkat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micaphone, Mistboy, Mitzi Mona, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Psych XS, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Bevictus, Vimek Zol, and Wesley. Who could ever possibly forget about Wesley? Anyways, you're all great. If you don't want to donate, then just like the video, comment on it, subscribe to my channel, share it around, do, do whatever. You know, again, I can't, I can't force you, but I, I'd appreciate it. Have a lovely day.